intrepid greeter, Aaron O'Brien. And the people who put the, uh, the refreshments together today. Suzanne Kohler and Suzanne and company provided a uh, food tray. Ruth O'Shane, O'Shane, uh, Lois DeNero, Carol Avick, and Jan Humphrey provided food. Setup was done by Carol Avick and by Christine Moore. And with that bit of business out of the way, I'd just like to ask out of curiosity, who is here for the first time? A lot of people. Very good. I'm glad to see that. You can use new attendees, new potential members. Welcome, and I hope you'll come back. I do want to point out that there will be a couple of more meetings coming up. One of them will be the March meeting, which is actually going to be on Saturday, March the 28th. So make sure you get that date straight. I'm informed that it's currently still wrong on the website if you can, in fact, access the website. <laughs> We're having a problem with it, which we hope to get fixed. And uh, I don't know how long that will take. But right now, uh, just remember that the next meeting is Saturday, March the 28th. Then we'll be having our meeting well, the March 28th meeting actually will be held with the League of Women Voters. So it may be an even bigger program than this one. We'll see. That would be very nice. Tom, uh, where will that be? In Old Town Hall. Old, old Town, Town Hall. Hall. <laughs> also, in Old Town Hall will be the April meeting, <coughs> which will be on Sunday, April 26th. That's the annual meeting. No, May is the annual meeting. Uh, I have a list here. We asked people to sign up a couple of meetings ago for the whole process of providing food and doing the work required to serve refreshments and all of that. So I'm going to pass this list around again and see if anybody would like to add their name to the list for the next two meetings. From our business point of view, one of the things we do is we hear the minutes from the prior meeting. So in the absence of uh, Jane Puffer, I will ask Don Corey to give us the minutes of the prior meeting. November 10th, 2019 meeting. The meeting was held at Old Town Hall. After refreshments were served, President Tom Kinzer opened the meeting at 2.30 p.m. with announcements. The following people were acknowledged for their help. Mary and Brian for her greeting hospitality, Carol Emmett, Meg Lashak, and Jan Humphrey for setup. Meg Lashak, Sharon McDonald, Jan Humphrey, and Carol Emmett, the bakers, and Ann Siemens for keeping the program. Uh, our secretary, Jane Puffer, was unable to attend the meeting due to a family medical emergency. And a shortened version of minutes for the October 23rd meeting is led by Acting Secretary Don Curry. Uh, he's also designated to the minute for this meeting. Tom Kinzer then introduced the program's speaker, Captain Robert Lewis, whose topic was the revolutionary battles of Saratoga in 1777. That colonial victory was extremely important because it led to greater support from France throughout the rest of the war. Can't hear you. In 1781, France sent a fleet that blockaded the entrance to Chesapeake Bay and drove off a British fleet in the Battle of the Capes. And General Cornwallis was then isolated, surrounded New York Town, was forced to surrender General Washington. Having given that background, the events leading up to the Battle of Saratoga and the battles themselves were then described in, the, in a film produced by the National Park Service. The program was well received. Don Corey, Acting Secretary. 
Thank you. Can I make one other announcement? Yes, you can. Madam Secretary, in the back, there's a table over there with a number of books, pictures, and things that are uh, being uh, disposed of by the Historical Society. As everybody knows, we're trying to clean out stuff that isn't relevant or that we have too, too many copies of because we got to make more room for the good stuff that keeps coming in. <laughs> Just make a donation, any donation, and help yourself to whatever strikes you as something that might be of interest. And you'll do me a big favor so I don't have to carry this stuff back to the office. Thank you. Very good. The major thing on our meeting today, of course, is a presentation on the fascinating subject of the Baker Chocolate Company, which is a uh, the, is the topic that our speaker, Mr. Anthony Samarco, will be speaking about today. And Mr. Samarco is a his, historian of the Boston area, teaches at BU, lectures at various groups and so forth around town and around the metropolitan area and he's speaking today to us. Afterwards, he's going to provide some of his books here, which you can purchase, and I'm sure he'd be happy to sign one for you, or more than one if you, if you wish to uh, buy more than one. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Samarco. <laughs> Thank you for coming today. If it was this sunny and I wasn't giving a lecture, I don't know if I would go out myself. But how many people here remember Baker's Chocolate? Well, it was something that our parents, our grandmothers, and even our great-grandmothers used. It was a wonderful chocolate, but it was usually a baking chocolate. So you had to combine it with sugar and other ingredients to make it palatable. The only time that you really could enjoy it was at 2 a.m. when there was nothing else in the freezer. But the whole idea is that Baker's Chocolate is one of a new series of books that I've been writing. For the last 30 years, I've been writing books on not only Boston history, but the neighborhoods. And I also began a series that talks about the favorite things of not only mine, but yours, that we've lost in recent years. And of course, the Baker Chocolate Company Though it exists today as under the auspices of Kraft's Family Food, I wrote a second book which was actually on the Jordan Marsh department store, something that many of us remember as not just a wonderful department store in Boston, but in 11 locations in suburban shopping. The third was the Howard Johnson Company, something that we might remember the clam strips and of course 28 flavors of ice cream. And presently I'm writing a book on S.S. Pearson Company, these are things that are shared memories, but they're also things that our children and grandchildren don't always know. And in some ways, to preserve them in a historical context, whether it's in the book and or in a slide lecture, gives us a way to begin to realize how fascinating and fun history can be. I only do this part-time. In real life, I'm an accountant, and I've had an MBA for 40 years. I don't think I could support myself just doing historical work. But at Boston University, I have young students at the beginning of the traditional age of 18. They go up to the age of 82, at least they did last semester. Okay. And I talk in some ways about these various subjects, not just chocolate, molasses, salt, but we begin to realize in some ways how they impact local history. But the Baker Chocolate Company, and this is the cover of the book, it's called A Sweet History, is something that not only chronicles the first chocolate manufacturer in the United States, but also the oldest that started in Dorchester in 1765. But we begin to realize in some ways, chocolate is something that many of us enjoy, but it's the end result of what is known as chocolato. Chocolate itself had been cultivated through cacao plantations in warm climates, beginning in the 13th and 14th centuries and it would be refined into what was then known as chocolatel, a savory drink. 
And it really wouldn't become a sweet drink that we would think of as cocoa until the early 18th century. But seeing here, this wonderful chocolate is something that few of us can resist, and some of us have an addiction to. But you also have to realize that chocolate has a god, truly a god of chocolate, and that is Quasilatl. Quasilatl was a fictitious god in the Toltec culture. This is an area of Central and South America, where, of course, they would have the cacao plantations. And during that period, they would have two ripenings annually, and an honored member of the community would wear this mask. It was a sacrificial type thing. They would actually burn the old branches of the cacao plants, and they would then fertilize the new ones that were growing. But the person would wear this mask, and this dates to about 1560, and it's in the collection of the British Museum, as something that was hopefully going to bring a prosperous and fortuitous cultivation. Well, in some ways, it was not just part of the culture, it was also something that was wanted by the Spanish. And in this conjectural drawing, it shows on the right-hand side Montezuma, the emperor of the Toltecs, and on the left-hand side, Hernandez Cortez. Cortez has a peace document. It meant nothing. <laughs> but Montezuma is holding the recipe for chocolate, which was something in some ways to be taken by the conquistadors back to Spain for the next century would become part of the royal and aristocratic circles that people would enjoy chocolate, which was flavored with vanilla and chili beans as something that was not just a delicious drink but was called the ambrosia of the gods. It wouldn't be until the granddaughter of the king of Spain married the Louis XIV that the recipe was included in her dowry and at that point, they began to actually flavor it with sugar and cream, and it became known as cocoa. Well, in many ways, by 1728, when this etching was done, chocolate was one of the drinks of choice throughout the world. At that point, on the left-hand side, one sees a man from Arabia drinking coffee. In the center, a man from China drinking tea. And on the right, a Toltec warrior who actually drinks ambrosia the chocolate from a hollowed coconut shell with gilt rounds. Now at that point, these three drinks were something that were enjoyed by people throughout the world. And in the 18th century, chocolate houses were being kind of opened, not just in Spain, Britain, as well as in France, but it was something that people quite enjoyed. But it was all derived from the Theobroma cacao tree. Now, these grow in extremely warm climates, anywhere from 10 to 20 miles north or south of the equator. They actually have 24 varieties, so each of the varieties has a subtly different flavor. But in the instance here, they were begun in the 13th and 14th century to be cultivated by the Toltecs. They would actually plant and then hope that they would grow. And not only did they have cacao pods grow from the branches of the tree, but they even grew from the trunk of the tree. Mm -hmm. They were no more than 15 to 20 feet in height, and they would actually have a cacao pod anywhere from nine to 11 inches in length, seven to nine inches in circumference. And this 18th century print shows it with large leaves that were evolved to actually protect it from the intensity of the sun. Because when it was broken open, there were individual cacao beans the size of one's thumbnails that would then be refined and dried into what we know of as the beginning of chocolate. But because it had ripening every six months, they not only had men and women, but even children cultivating the uh, cacao plantations, but they had these long poles that would knock them from the tree when they ripened. As they fell, the people in the foreground would collect them with wicker baskets. And at that point, the beans themselves, and again, this is an 18th century etching, show that there were anywhere from 35 to 40 individual beans within each pod. They were held together by a membrane, and at this point, the refining process would open them, remove the membranes, and then clean the beans so they could be air and sun dried. Now, this is a stereo view of 1905. It shows two young boys in the foreground breaking open the cacao pods. But the pallets were actually one layer of cacao beans. 
And because of the intensity of the sun, remember, it's only 10 to 20 miles north or south of the equator, they would air and sun dry within three weeks. There was no inverse effect. They could be held 10, 20, 30 years before they were used. But in that instance, cacao beans themselves would produce, when roasted and made into chocolate, one of the most delicious commodities many of us still know today. But the whole story of Baker's chocolate started in 1765. This is a map of Dorchester on the top and Milton on the right. It's divided by the Naponsa River, which is named for the Naponsa tribe of the Massachusetts Indians. Well, Dorchester and Milton were once part of the same community. Dorchester was settled in 1630 and included even what is today South Boston, Squarnham and Quincy, Milton, Foxborough, Rentham, Raynham, Canton, Sharon, and Stoughton, and went within 144 rods of the Rhode Island border. It was one of the most affluent of the communities of the Puritans. But the Puritans would also dam the river as early as 1634, and the water power that was afforded by the damming of the river would start in 1634, the first grist mill in New England. In 1678, the first gunpowder factory in New England. In 1728, the first paper mill in New England, and in 1765, the first chocolate mill in the United States. Well, the idea was that it's known as Baker's Chocolate, a little bit of a pun on the name. All of us would be bakers if we baked with it, but the concept here was it was started by Dr. James Baker. Now, he's a very wealthy man. He lived in Dorchester. He was born on what is today Washington Street, near Common Square. He was educated in the local schools, but he was graduated from Harvard College in 1760. The concept at that time was that if one had attended Harvard, he would become a minister. And he did study for two years, but he decided not to become a minister. In 1763, he decided to teach school. And after a year, smart man, he decided not to teach because I'm sure the little children in Dorchester are monsters. And in 1764, after nine months of arduous study, he became Dr. James Baker. And he would use the title of Doctor of Medicine until the day he died. But according to the history of Dorchester, in 1765, he was keeping a store at Baker's Corners in Dorchester. Today, it's known as Codman Square, and it was the corner of what is today Talbot Avenue and Washington Street. And there, he provided all the things people would need, flour, sugar, butter, brooms, and things of that sort. And according to the history, he met a man by the name of John Hannon, a recent Irish immigrant who had come to Dorchester, and he had no prospects in life. And when he met him, he realized that Hannon did have one. He knew how to make chocolate because he had been making chocolate in London throughout the early 1760s. And of course, Dr. Baker set him up on a mill on the banks of the Neponset River. And in 1765, we see Mr. Hannon waving to us in the doorway. And of course, with his three-cornered hat at the bridge, Dr. James Baker. Well, he financed it. And what they began to produce was a fine chocolate. It was cacao at 85%. Now, if you've ever been to the stores and you realize that 85% cacao is so bitter you can hardly stand it, it's the most pure chocolate that's available. And in that instance, between 1765 and 1779, it wasn't known as Baker's chocolate, it was known as Hannon's Best. And this is a piece of paper made by the Boys of McLean Paper Company on the Neponset River that would be wrapped around the bar of chocolate. And you can see it was a scale of liberty. And it says at the very bottom, if the chocolate does not prove good, the money will be returned. And it's thought to be one of the first money back guarantees in the United States. Well, Hannah did produce a fine chocolate, and he had a man by the name of Nathaniel Blake, who was apprentice, and they produced upwards of 2,000 pounds of chocolate a month. It sounds like a tremendous amount at that time, but it was suspended in June, July, and August, as, as if we can really wonder why. <laughs> but in that instance, he had done extremely well. And in 1779, he went to the West Indies to procure further cacao beans, and he never returned home. 
the next year the widow hen and sold her half share and the company became known as Baker Chocolate Company. And it was operated by three generations of the Baker. And seen here is Walter Baker, the grandson of the founder, who would actually run the company between 1811 and 1852. Like his father and grandfather before him, he too was educated at Harvard College. But after school, he decided to pursue a law degree with Judge Tappan Reeves, which he did in Litchfield, Connecticut. So when he returned to Dorchester to assume the presidency of his family's business, he was not just equipped with a classical education, but he had a law degree to protect it because there were many other manufacturers of chocolate, not just in Boston, but throughout the New England states. In that instance, Walter Baker himself began to produce in some ways the best chocolate that was available, but in a variety of different types. One of them was actually not just the premium number one, the 85% cacao, but they also provided cocoa. And beginning in 1824, he used as his trademark a young maiden with a cornucopia, spewing forth the different types of chocolate that would be made nine months out of the year. You had to realize at this period of time, they had upwards of 20 employees, half men, half women. And they actually, in some ways, were not just successful, but they were tuned as having some of the best products on the market. Now, one of the things that they produced was called Broma. Has anybody ever heard of chocolate Broma? Has anybody ever heard of Broma Seltzer? Oh, you have eaten at my sister's house. <laughs> well, Broma was something that was an effervescent drink, but in this instance, it was an effervescent water that was added to cocoa, and with shaved ice was one of the most refreshing drinks in the summer months. And in that instance, it was said here at the very top, in the opinions of eminent physicians of Boston, that they have tried Baker's Chocolate Broma, and they feel as though it is a good source of not only nutrients, but it is good for the health. Well, not only was it good for you, but it tasted fantastic. Well, the eminent physicians even had their names listed. John Collins Warren, the first man to perform surgery with ether at the Massachusetts General Hospital. George Howard, John Holmans, Walter Channing, um, Zabdale Boylston Adams, and of course, John Ware. These were not only eminent physicians, but they were also members of Walter Baker's class at Harvard. <laughs> so not only were they purported to be not only helpful, but they were supporting it. But the broadsides that were made in that period between the 1840s and early 1850s were beautiful. This is something that is actually three feet by five feet, and they would be printed locally and sent to any store that actually sold Baker chocolate goods. So not only did they make chocolate, they made cocoa, broma, cocoa paste, homeopathic chocolate, and dietetic cocoa. It was something that had a reduced caffeine count. And if you don't realize it, coffee and tea combined doesn't have as much caffeine as chocolate. Well, these were things that made Walter Baker not just known, but it was something in some ways that people actually only used Baker's chocolate. The unfortunate thing was he died in 1852. His son, Walter Baker Jr., was living in London and didn't want anything to do with the business except for royalties, and the daughter was living in Paris. The only person that could actually assume control of the company was his step-nephew, Henry Pierce. Now, Henry Pierce had been working for his step-uncle at the counting room, which was at South Market, at Quincy Market in Boston. He made a dollar fifty a day. It wasn't a tremendous amount of money, but it was obvious that the boy had potential. He had been educated at Milton Academy and later the Bridgewater Normal School. But at the age of 20, he started with his step-uncle and learned the business. In 1854, the trustees of the Baker Estate allowed him to lease the name of Baker's Chocolate on a 10-year basis at $3,000 a year. It was a tremendous sum of money. In 1854, a well-to-do family could live on $2,000 a year. So he had to guarantee $3,000 annually, and he did it. And for the next 30 years, he was able to lease it and not able to buy it until 1884. Well, Henry Pierce himself had inherited the old stone mill on the left-hand side. 
It was a building that had been built in 1849 of granite. It was thought impervious to fire because the previous one had burned to the ground. It also had metal floors and a metal roof. And in that way, the 20 employees could make chocolate. But the whole idea was, Henry Pierce reinvested in this business and continued to do extremely well so that he would have nine buildings with new factories by the time of his death in 1896. And in the distance, in the very center, was the first of the buildings that he had constructed in 1872, and he named the Pierce Mill. Well, the Pierce Mill was something that would be designed by Nathaniel Bradley. If you are interested in architecture, Nathaniel Bradley is probably one of the best known of the Boston architects of the 19th century. Have you ever been to the Boston South End and you see the red bricks, well bay facade buildings, they share the same height, setback, and building material? It was he who designed the Boston Row House. He was a wealthy man in his own right, but by the 1860s he could choose his clients, and he also specialized in industrial architecture. Well, in 1872, he would design the first of the buildings, the Pierce Mill. Not only was it built of red brick, but it was the fashionable Second French Empire that was built in Boston at the period. It fronted onto Washington Street and backed up onto the Neponset River. And this building, which was built two years after Dorchester had become part of the city of Boston, was indicative of the type of buildings that were intended to be built in Dorchester. Dorchester had been an independent town from 1630 until 1870. And upon 1870, when they annexed themselves to the city, they had 12,000 residents. In 1900, only 30 years later, there were 100,000 residents. And Baker's Chocolate was one of the biggest reasons. It had two shifts daily, and it employed men and women to the tune of over 2,200 people by the turn of the century. The Pierce Mill was one of at least nine, eventually 11, that would be built by 1920. And they were actually places that were beehives day and night. And you began to realize in some ways that at that time in the 1850s and 1860s, you can imagine the aroma of chocolate, but it was not only roasted, but finely made. But a lot of people don't realize it wasn't just Baker's chocolate. Lower Mills was called Chocolate Village because there were four manufacturers of chocolate. There was Preston's Chocolate from 1798. There was Dr. Ware's Chocolate from 1843. And there was Webb and Twombly that was from 1847. Each of these companies were very successful. And you can imagine who they hired for these new chocolate companies. But the idea was that Henry Pierce bought them out and by 1881, when he bought out the Webb and Twombly Chocolate Company, he built a new mill on the Milton side of the river and named it the Webb Mill. And in that instance, each of these individual mills would make a specific type of chocolate. By 1900, there were 21 varieties of chocolate that were being made in addition to cocoa. So the mills were an important feature and you would have dozens of people working on every floor. As I said earlier, there were many women that worked for the company. By the 1840s, they had three women, and they were the Shield sisters, Christina and Mary, and they would actually wrap bars of chocolate day and night and pack them away. But they had a woman by the name of Martha Pond. Martha Pond worked for the company for over 40 years. She was somebody who was the keeper of the secrets. Now remember, Cacao trees had 24 distinct varieties and 24 different flavors. So if you wanted to make the same chocolate next week that you did this week and have the same flavor, you had to know what the proportion of ingredients were. Martha Pond kept the secret. She was a deaf mute. And she, who probably could never have gotten a job anywhere else, worked for 40 years for Baker's Chocolate. Well, by the period of 1900, when these photographs were taken, the staff was 60% women and 40% men. And the women did go the gamut of stenographers and chocolate wrappers and cocoa fin tillos, but they were also in some ways a major feature of the company because some dressed as the demonstrator come to life. 
The area in and around Dorchester and Milton was so densely built up by 1900, and this is actually called a broadly fire map. Pink buildings are built of brick, yellow buildings are built of wood, but this was a neighborhood that had commercial growth around what became known as Pierce Square, named for Henry Pierce, but it was surrounded by residential development. As I said, Dorchester's population in 1900 hit 1,000 people, 100,000 people. Milton in 1900 was about 3,200 people. So in this instance, the area was a place that attracted people, not only for employment, but for employment of many decades. What did they make? Well, chocolate, we sometimes say is chocolate. Do you like light, milk, dark? But in this instance, Premium number one was the major chocolate they made. Have you ever gone into a store and they have different flavors, but it's also a very high cacao count, and you think it's gonna be the most delicious thing you've ever imagined when you get home, and then you realize how bitter and not very pleasant the taste is? Well, the cacao in this was at least 85 to 90%, and wrapped in a label with a cream label on the top, it was something that was one of the best sellers. But bakers would also make German sweet chocolate. This actually was made by a man named Samuel German. He had come from England, and in the 1830s, he was Walter Baker's coachman. But in 1839, he asked for a job in the factory, and Walter Baker gave him a job making chocolate. Well, it was his ingenious idea to combine sugar with the molten chocolate that when it was molded, it was readily edible. And in that instance, Walter Baker not only gave him a bonus of $1,000, but he named the new chocolate German Sweet Chocolate. They also made things such as vanilla chocolate. Does anybody here like vanilla or white chocolate? Well, there's no chocolate in it whatsoever. As you might have said, it's more fattening than dark and milk chocolate combined. Well, it was true. In the 18th century, when they actually made the chocolate, it had a 50% co cocoa count, which was something that was actually an oily substance. It had to be removed, and of course, through the conching machine, they created what was called cocoa butter. Now, cocoa butter was used for a variety of purposes in the 19th century for the cosmetic industry. But by the late 19th century, Baker's was combining it with flour and vanilla to make it into white chocolate. Well, not only did they have sweet tablets, which were quite nice, but they would also have, as you can see here, um, smoothness, delicacy, and flavor, good to eat and good to drink. So not only you could have white chocolate demi tasse but you could also have white chocolate tablets. Quite delicious, but no chocolate. They also made Caracas sweet chocolate, which was a little bit darker than the other chocolates that were made. And it was simply for the fact that the beans were brought from Caracas, Venezuela. So beans were imported from not just Mexico and South America, the West Indies, the Caribbean, Caracas, even Africa, each one of them having a distinct flavor. 21 varieties by 1900, but none of them could compare to the cocoa, which was 50% of the average annual sales throughout the 19th and early 20th century. And as it says in some ways, it's not just breakfast cocoa, but it was thought delicious at any time of the day. Well, Bankers was doing extremely well. And we realized that Henry Pierce was not just somebody who was reinvesting in the business, but he was also importing a tremendous amount of cacao beans from various countries. They'd arrive in Boston on a ship and be floated out to Dorchester by barge. There they would be unloaded into this subterranean rooms, and this is the Pierce Mill, where they would actually be placed into either canvas sacks or wooden boxes, and they'd be stenciled with country of origin and date. As I mentioned, they could have 30 years of shelf life with no adverse effect. But once they began to produce chocolate, they no longer did it by hand. Henry Pierce, who went to Europe every summer of his life, wasn't going on a vacation he was going to see how others manufactured chocolate. So he'd take a trip of eight weeks to visit English, French, German, Swiss, even Italian chocolate makers. And he imported these German rotisseries in 1888. At the very top was a conveyor belt, and the cacao beans would be brought down, roasted, 
and then brought down to the pulling machines where the outer shell of the cacao bean was removed. At that point, it was a glutinous substance of 50% chocolate, you can see it on the left-hand side, and 50% cocoa butter. And in this instance, the men wear leather aprons to protect their clothing, but it would be allowed to air and sun dry and then be placed into the conching machines on the right-hand side. For two weeks, the conching machines would simply tumble the chocolate, and eventually the cocoa butter itself would solidify and fall out of the individual conching machines. And at that point, they could make whatever chocolate they intended to do that day. Well, the whole idea was, once they had made the chocolate, they'd be brought to the wrapping stations. As I mentioned, as early as the 1840s, they had women working at the company. These wrapping stations were almost in every one of the mills. Each woman had a workstation. They'd bring her 50 or 60 chocolate bars. She would wrap it in paper and then affix a label and place them into small boxes that were brought to the shipping dock. Other women might fill cocoa tins. And the tins could go from a half a pound up to five pounds in size. Once they filled it with the cocoa, affixed a paper label, again placed it to a box and brought to the shipping dock. But the whole idea was Baker's Chocolate was connected to Boston by the Old Colony Railroad. Dorchester, who actually had seen Nathan Carew, the first president of the Old Colony, purchasing an estate there in 1842, had actually laid out a branch called the Dorchester and Milton Branch, and it connected what is today Ashmont Station in Dorchester with Mattapan Station. Baker's Chocolate would actually see these cars, where chocolate initially could be delivered to Boston by either bars or cocoa tins, but by the 1940s, by cocoa cars, which were like a, almost a gas tank that were filled with liquid chocolate. <laughs> but in this instance, we realized that these men in the foreground could deliver chocolate locally. Their laminated um, things on the carts could actually protect the chocolate for an hour or two before they got to their destination. But in the 19th century, Baker's Chocolate was also doing these broadsides, just like Walter Baker had done previous to 1850. And as it says, they made American and vanilla chocolates, prepared chocolate broma, and homeopathic cocoa. Well, this I know is probably 1850, because on the right-hand side it has a frontiersman. And it is known that Baker's Chocolate was sent around the Cape Horn to California, where it would actually be sent to the San Francisco gold rushers. They would also make, in some ways, cookbooks. And this cookbook, which dates to the centennial of the United States in 1876, was something that had 100 pages, and if you followed the directions precisely, you could melt chocolate and combine it with other ingredients to make things such as Radcliffe, Smith, or Mount Holyoke Fudge, eclairs, or even the most wonderful desserts that would impress family and friends. But notice, in the four corners of this cookbook were gold medals. Beginning in 1854, Henry Pierce would not only enter his chocolate into competitions, such as at the Topsfield Fair or the Marshfield Fair, but he also entered them into competitions against European chocolate manufacturers, and they actually won gold medals for the quality of their product. Well, the cookbooks were a major feature. But Henry Pierce also wanted to replace the original logo. Do you remember the woman with the cornucopia? Mm -hmm. Well, he decided he wanted to use this. Her name was Das Chocolat Maiden. And it was a painting that hanged in the Dresden Art Gallery. She was a real woman, according to the history. Her name was Anna Baltouf. Her father was a knight, Melchior, of the court of the Empress Maria Theresa. And the story was that she was somebody who was impoverished. Her father had lost his money and she was reduced to serving chocolate in a chocolate shop in Vienna. Well, she looked quite charming, and she served chocolate with a glass of water to a very handsome man, who not only proposed to her, but happened to be the nephew of Maria Theresa, the Empress of Austria. Kind of a nice, fortuitous marriage. In that instance, he had her portrait painted as a chocolate server, and it hung in their palace until 1825, when it was given to the Gallery Alta Meister, which is the Royal Portrait Gallery in Dresden. 
and in that instance, this became the new trademark. It was embossed on every bit of chocolate, every shipping, and even documents of stationery that would see the new thing. It was even on these pieces of beautiful chocolate service. I bought this at Skinner's a few years ago. I still don't know where I put it. But it had a chocolate pot, cups and sauces, a beautiful tray. But they would have Shelley Bone China in England. They would have Limoges in France and Dresden in Germany producing these. But they didn't just produce them to be pretty. If you saved your individual coupons off the chocolate and cocoa tins, you could trade those coupons for these wonderful tea sets, not tea sets, coffee sets. And in that way, if it was said to be the best chocolate in the world, what better way to stir it with a silver spoon? And of course, with La Belle Chocolatier at the end, you began to realize in some ways that this is the company that did some of the most wonderful advertising and marketing at the turn of the 20th century. Well, Henry Pierce, in a lot of ways, had entered his company into competition against other chocolate manufacturers. By the 1870s and 1880s, he was going to Europe on an annual basis. But the United States in 1893 had the Columbian Exhibition. It was something that was actually going to be one of these things that attracted every aspect of industrial America to go to Chicago. And seen here, Henry Pierce hired Carey and Hastings, the most expensive and society architect in all of the country. They built a pavilion that was supposed to last for nine months of white marble that was actually built for $60,000. So in 1893, a very gorgeous mansion could actually be bought for less than $8,000. In this instance, you ascend the staircase on either side, and you come into a room that would have these displays. Cocoa tins, bars of chocolate, apothecary jars filled with chocolate bonbons made from the cookbooks. And the surprising thing was, within this area would usually be women making chocolate. Not only would they melt it, but they'd also combine it with other ingredients to make up devil's food cake with devil's food frosting. And if you were there, and they cut the cake, you were invited to taste it. Many people began to realize that not only was it free, but cocoa was served, bits of chocolate, as well as cookies and fudge and cake. Well, in the four rooms, four corners of the room were actual desks, and at each of the desks were pre-stamped postcards of La Belle Chocolatier. And you were encouraged to write home to family and friends and say, I just tasted Baker's chocolate, and so too should you. And for one penny, it was something that broadcasted Baker's from the East Coast to the West Coast, and in many times made the company continue. So much so that by 1900, they were producing, do you remember the 2,000 pounds of chocolate a month? They were producing 250,000 tons of chocolate a month. In that instance, these souvenirs were things such as chocolate trays. This chocolate tray shows La Belle Chocolatier, but a little pavilion that was the Richmond, Virginia Pavilion for 1907, designed by Edward J. Lewis. It was something that they saved money on that because they brought it back to Milton and re-erected it as a house that they sold. They also did this one in San Francisco in 1915. Look at the minaret, roof, cocoa in electric lights, the elephant heads on either pavilion, and of course, the demonstrators would greet you and encourage you to come into the baker's chocolate. Not only did they have hot cocoa and cooling chocolate broma, but they had a variety of things that they would make on a daily basis. Well, these fantastic places were things that not only encouraged people to taste the chocolate, and I doubt few of us would have to be coerced, <laughs> but in that instance, it was something that children and adults liked as well. But don't forget, they also went to local fairs, and this is actually the Marshville Fair about 1915. And it was a simple tent set up, and they would actually serve, as you can see here, not only the hot cocoa, but also the broma. And it was something that was, again, something that people might enjoy, men and women. Well, bakers, by the period of the early 20th century, would have people that went the gamut from teenagers right up until their 70s. These three young girls actually were the typical girls that we hired 
and some of them would stay 30, 40, or even 50 years. The one on the left holds a baker's chocolate cocoa tray. The girl in the center, a half pound of cocoa. And the girl on the right, a Shelly Boat China cup and salsa with La Belle Chocolatier in profile. They were an important feature because they were the demonstrators. They were the trademark come to life. And they went throughout the country to actually show the Baker Chocolate Company and what it could do in some ways to change your diet. Well, the recipe books were actually called choice receipts, much like our ancestors would have had in the 18th century. They started off as 10-page booklets, but by 1900 were beautifully illustrated, colored photographs of all of the various things that they made, but they also had articles on the nutritional quality of chocolate. And it was written by this woman, Ellen Swallow Richards. Has anybody ever heard of this woman? Ellen Richards was probably one of the more intelligent women of the 19th century. She came from a well-to-do family. She was educated at Vassar College. But after that, she decided she wanted to study both biology and chemistry. And she applied to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Well, tech, as it was called, was something that not only offered electrical engineering and architectural degrees, but it was an old male bastion. She was allowed in 1881 to take courses. They didn't think that a woman could possibly understand <laughs> chemistry, let alone biology. And of course, it was something that I knew she would fail. <laughs> Two years later, she received her master's, which was a dual master's. And she also married her college professor. <laughs> because she had done so well, she was somebody who had actually come from great wealth. She decided in the 1880s to establish what were called the New England soup kitchens. Now, during that period of time, she would go to the North End and the South End and the West End of Boston. She would meet with immigrant women. And what she would do was to teach them how to cook highly nutritious but low-cost soups, stews, breads, and all sorts of different things that people coming home from the factories at night could purchase rather than eating food that was simply not good for them. During that period, she funded them out of her own pocket. And she was actually able to do these so that some of them would cater to Lebanese, some to Italian, and various languages would be spoken. But she was also somebody by 1890 who was hired by Baker Chocolate Company to write about the nutritional value of chocolate. When I read that, I loved her immediately. <laughs> but the whole idea was she did this on an annual basis, and it was never the same article. And she was somebody who would then be honored by the city of Austin with a school in Dorchester, the Ellen Richards School. But she was also somebody in some ways that is not only a woman who bucked the system, but actually became part of the Baker Chocolate legacy. Well, by 1900, the company was well into its second century. We began to realize that they wanted to show that they and very few other companies could claim that they'd been in existence for 100 years. They decided to do a calendar, and this was actually done for 1900. And for every 20 years, if that is perceived as a, a generation, they would have six generations of Americans that knew and loved Baker's chocolate. Well, seen here, it says, it's 1780, my lady drinks her first cup of Baker's chocolate. And it says that the house of Walter Baker and Company was founded in the year 1780 in Dorchester, Massachusetts. The woman looks out at us with her export porcelain cup and saucer. Martha Washington hangs on the wall, and a wonderful King Charles Spaniel looks at us quizzically. Well, the next generation, in 1800, 20 years later, the fame of Baker's chocolate, cocoa, grows with that of the young republic. Pure cocoa acts as a gentle stimulant and invigorates and corrects the action of digestive organs. It wasn't just delicious, it was good for you. And 20 years later, to speed the part against, Walter Baker and Company is known and served in every hostelry or inn. On a journey, you cannot take any refreshment so wholesome, sustaining, and delicious. In 1840, doctors now recommend Baker's chocolate as a beneficent restorer of exhaustive power. Now get this, it's a perfect food, preserves health, prolongs life, soothes both stomach and brain. I've always 
wondered if that was a fashion statement with the ribbon around her forehead. But if you notice on the small table, she's being served chocolate in a liquid format by a spoon from a pork glass. And in 1860, it's the fashion to take a cup of baker's chocolate after a constitutional. They say that the people who make constant use of chocolate are the ones who enjoy the most steady health and are the least subject to a multitude of little ailments which destroy the comfort of life. And in 1800, La Belle Chocolatier now enters the whole millions of homes as the trademark of the finest chocolate and cocoa in the world. But the sixth generation descendant was not going to keep her hourglass figure if she continued to drink her cocoa and eat her chocolate but she was the quintessential Gibson girl of 1900, and she was the sixth generation descendant of La Belle Chocolatier. Well, Henry Pierce had invested tremendously. He not only had increased the company 400 fold during his lifetime, but this man, who had actually started off in debt, would die owning the company and being appraised at $71 million. <laughs> In 1896, he was probably the wealthiest man, not only in Dorchester, but one of the wealthiest in Boston. This portrait, done by Bonnet, was done in Paris. He had served as mayor of Boston in 1872 and 1877. He had been a United States congressman between 1883 and 1886, and the city of Boston had named Pierce Square in his honor. But at his death, he didn't just leave trust funds to his nieces and nephews. He had never married, nor did he have children of his own. But he would leave to every employee in his employ at the time of his death $1,000 for every year of service. And the average annual service was 40 years. So in essence, he realized that the employees were the reason for the success of his business. And in essence, he repaid in kind their diligence and their work. Well, the company was sold, and in 1897, it was bought by the Forbes Syndicate, headed by J. Murray Forbes, whose summer house was on Milton Hill. But the financiers were primarily Boston businessmen. They paid 4.75 million, a tremendous sum. And what they did was to market the company in nationwide magazines. Liberty, Look, Colliers, The Youth's Companion, each of these beautiful magazines would have full color, full page advertisements, and they touched upon every aspect of American society. So this young child, blonde and blue eyed, now I have my dolly, pretty soon I'll have my cocoa. Well, if she wanted Baker's cocoa, we better give it to her. Children loved it, but so too did fraternity men when one of their sisters shows up unannounced. The fraternity house didn't have beer and wine. She sets up an improvised cocoa table, and there she serves as the center of attraction, a cup of baker's cocoa to her brother and his fraternity men. Children like it, young college men like it. Even during World War I, the dough boys were not drinking wine in France. Here, somewhere, the boys are drinking a baker cocoa toast to mothers, fathers, wives, or sweethearts with delicious as dreams of home. Every aspect of society knew bakers and loved it. Even theater actresses, which in 1907 were a little bit removed from polite society. But here they sit and say, there's nothing so soothing, refreshing, and delicious after a strenuous night on the stage as a cup of baker's cocoa. As you can see, it was children, fraternity men, doughboys in World War I, theater actresses, but even Little Red Riding Hood now approached Grandmother's house with a basket of Christmas dainties made by Baker's chocolate and cocoa. So the whole aspect of these advertisements not only made you laugh, but they made people laugh. And if you do, that usually is a sense of at least 50% that you're going to buy the purchase. And I bet in some ways many people looked at Baker's chocolate as the best that was available in the market. Well, during that period, the Forbes Syndicate built the last of the buildings, the 11th Mill. This building is called the Administration Building. It was on the Dorchester side, but it wasn't designed by Nathaniel Bradley. It was designed by George Shepard, a man who actually was partners with George Stearns and Stearns and Shepard in Boston. Built of red brick, 
limestone columns. It had a neon sign that said Walter Bank. You couldn't miss it coming into the lower mills. But it was here that the president's office was located. But the interior was sheathed in white marble, and they would have at the top of the stairs a six-foot-tall portrait of La Belle Chocolatière. It was done by a man named Norman Price. Not a well-known artist, but he was the tutor to a man by the name of Norman Rockwell. And in that way, the portrait still stands there. But at the top of the staircase, the demonstrators would greet honored guests. So whether they were coming for a meeting with the president, or they were the local Boy Scout or Girl Scout troop that usually came four or five times a year, they would be greeted with cocoa, brownies, cookies, and everything imaginable. And in that way, many people realized at the top of the stairs, it was not just grand, but it was the epitome of success, thanks to the Bakers and Henry Pierce. Well, in many ways, seen here from a hot air balloon, the area by 1927 was completely built up. In the very center of that white building is the administration building we just saw. And on the left was the Forbes, the Baker, and the Webb Mill. And in the foreground, the Ware Mill, the Preston Mill, the Adam Street Mill. And each of these were not only functioning, but they had two shifts daily. But in 1928, the Forbes Syndicate decided to sell. And they sold it to a company called Postum Corporation. It became General Foods. And what they immediately did was to combine the chocolate of Baker's chocolate with their other concerns, not only of nuts and coconut, to make readily edible chocolates. And in that instance, on the left-hand side, we saw Baker's breakfast cocoa, German sweet chocolate, premium number one, and dot chocolate. But on the right-hand side, they began to make milk chocolate bars, and of course bars combined with other ingredients that made it as something that you could simply open it and eat it. Because some of the competitors, such as Nestle's and Hershey's, catered themselves in such a way that they provided to the public readily edible chocolate. Baker's was always something you had to melt and combine with other ingredients to make it palatable. And during that period, they would actually do these advertisements much like the Forbes Syndicate. But I love these. My niece Mabel was all of a dither. <laughs> and it says, now why can't I make chocolate cake like that, she wailed. Well, not only could she make it, but she followed the recipe in the Baker chocolate receipt book. You see the recipe on the right-hand side. She wouldn't actually be in a dither any longer. They also produced Wellesley fudge cake. You had to realize as early as the 1870s, they were producing chocolate that was named after female colleges. Well, Wellesley Fudge Cake was named after Wellesley College. And it said it was made with Baker's chocolate and is a taste you just never outgrow. Well, not only was it delicious, but it was something that was rich and Baker chocolate known for. You also, in some ways, saw that even cocoa could be used in making a cake. And it says that Baker's cocoa makes it good, but Baker's makes it best. Well, in that instance, these were advertisements that people not only saw here in Bedford, Massachusetts, but even in California. And it became, in some ways, one of the major reasons they expanded in the 1930s and 40s. Now, this was a calibrating machine, a job I would have loved to have had. They would make different sized chocolate chips. <laughs> well, this man would calibrate it to make either the mini chips or a larger chip. Through the mechanization, it was something that they could go very quick and then package them to be sold. But it was also the fact they would make bars of chocolate, in this instance, 25 pounds in size, that would then be sold to specialty shops that did hand-dipped bonbons. So through this mechanization, you began to realize not only chocolate chips, chocolate bars, but even the fact that cocoa tins were now on a conveyor belt and I've always thought of the I Love Lucy segment <laughs> when they have that. You see that the women wear drip-dry rayon outfits, much like La Belle Chocolatier, but no longer are they tins, but they're cardboard containers, and they would fill them quicker than you could imagine. In fact, one woman, Hazel Stone Stanley, seen on the left-hand side, was awarded a week's salary because she was the fastest woman to ever fill a cocoa tin in the history of the company. Now, you might say to yourself, wow, that's incredible. 
The man giving her the award is on the right-hand side, Curtis Gagger. He was the president of the Baker Division of General Foods. Well, she had worked for the company for over 30 years, her husband for 40 years. And the idea was she really, truly did fill Coco tins, and she was recognized, and here she's showing him how she did it. But Curtis Gagger wasn't just the president, he also did something that was really quite impressive. He had attended Harvard University and later had his master's from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. When he graduated, he was given this job at Baker's Chocolate, and he created what was called the Chocolate Bath. Have you ever bought a bar of Baker's Chocolate that is scored into one ounce squares? That's a bath of chocolate. What he did was to create a specific mold that when the liquid chocolate was put in, and then when it solidified, you could simply break off two ounces or three ounces of chocolate to make it into whatever you were doing, a brownie or cake or cookie. But in that instance, whether it was her filling of cocoa tins or his chocolate bath, they both did something that made Baker's Chocolate employees' workforce realize they saved them time and money. And that was an important feature because it didn't matter who you were, the background of your education, or where you had come from, each one of them were equally important. It was also the fact that by the 1950s, they also made instant cocoa. And this, of course, was the new Baker's 4-in-1. It's more chocolatey, mixes faster, hot or cold. It didn't quite have the cachet of making cocoa from scratch, which I always loved, but it was something in some ways that actually simplified and saved time. But they also made cakes such as this. Imagine this gorgeous four-layer cake, so inexpensive. It's the Baker chocolate that makes it taste so luxuriously rich. And you can see here at the bottom, the Baker chocolate with the baths themselves. Well, the whole idea was you too could actually make this if you followed the directions. And of course, in 1957, there was a contest to make something with German sweet chocolate. And a woman who was a housewife in Dallas, Texas, won the award when she made, of course, German sweet chocolate. She combined it with chopped nuts, coconut, and of course made something that today we always hope somebody will serve for dessert. It's not happened yet, but... <laughs> well, looking at the mills, you realized it was not only something that would close in 1966. The company moved to Dover, Delaware, and the buildings remained fairly vacant. There was a travel agency, there was a furniture store, and the administration became the local welfare office. But it was also, by the early 1990s, to become a place that had mixed housing luxury condos, luxury apartments, uh, mid-price condos, of course, as well as not only uh, subsidized apartments, but handicapped accessible. And today the administration building is artist loft. So when we begin to realize that Baker's Chocolate founded in really 1780, not only employed so many people that it was the second largest employer on the South Shore, the first being Fort River Shipyard, that by the 1990s, it was to become something that not only reveled in its rich past, but that the buildings were restored and became in some ways home to people, whereas at one time, it was a place of employment. And in that way, from 2,200 people on a daily basis, it's now at about 1,200 people. Today, when we think of Baker's Chocolate as sweet history, it's not just a fascinating glimpse into what we think of as an industrial manufacturer of chocolate, but it's a sweet memory from the past. Thank you, I hope you enjoyed <laughs>
he basically argued with her, and though they did have one child, it's said that he went to the West Indies to get cacao beans, but it's thought that he went back to the hills of Ireland where he lived out his life in splendor. <laughs> but it's not known where he went. Please. Um, I, mean, I just want to say we lived in the chocolate factory for five years before moving to Bedford. Mm -hmm. And we lived in the um, Baker building. <clears throat> and um, it was not a condominium at that time, it was apartments. We lived on the fifth floor. And on the fifth floor, the, you saw one of the pictures of our um, people working. The round columns, the steel columns, were still there. Uh, our windows were about 10 feet tall, many of them, you know, right along with most, it was a fabulous apartment. The brick walls were about to Was one of your neighbors Folly Wheelwright? <laughs> no. There was a man that lived there. He bought the condo for $49,000. Folly Wheelwright was uh, a minister in the back bay at Arlington Street Church. And when he decided to go to Fox Hill Village, he sold it for like $1.2 million. <laughs> so it's something that was a great investment, but it was a great story too. Uh, it was great because the river went right under the building. That's right, yes. And so there was, uh, it was a beautiful area the, um, below, right below to the right of this building. Um, the river goes under and through a gorge, um, which is just a beautiful area. 1634, they dammed it. They, they used to have what were called ale wives. So what they finally were able to propagate it. Any other questions or comments? Please. You were talking about the Amherst chocolate and the Harvard, whatever. There's another one of those called Wealthy Fudge Cake. We saw it up here. And it was when I went to school there, and when we got it, we were reminded about this story and that this was a way to somehow or another, although not to us, it's just great cake and it's different. But it symbolized the sort of baker chocolate tradition. It was. I think a lot of times when you think about the Wellesley fudge cake, it's even served at the Wellesley in an occasion. But the whole idea was these colleges was something, and I hate it to say, but 100 years ago, most women that graduated from Smith, Vassar, um, Mount Holyoke, Radcliffe, didn't go on like Ellen Swallow Richards. Many of them became just housewives, and that was fine. But the idea was they did this in such a way that it was incredible. Today, many women can't even imagine going to college and not having a professional career. But the whole idea was they were expected to marry. But Baker's Chocolate always named them after specific things, and they targeted it as a marketing agent. And it worked. It really did. So um, I guess certain people would have to eat bass or fudge for the rest of their lives. <laughs> Any other questions? I do have a few books here. Everything is $20, and it's illustrated with many other things that you might not see in this. Thank you for coming.